Welcome to another episode of Truth Matters, where today we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the topics that we discussed before. Uh, again, I'm joined by Mackenzie Drebit and Walter Feit to bring everybody a, uh, a bit of an urgent message in this episode. Uh, we are going to continue looking at what we've looked at before, which are some of the secret societies and the powers behind that, and, and really point to things that will help you, the viewer, come to understand the nature of the reality that we live in and of the current circumstances that we are in, but also give you some more specifics about the organizations and the individuals that are currently turning the wheels as the daily lives of individuals around the world are being uprooted. So today, uh, we hope that you will uh, learn and enjoy some of the materials that we plan to bring to you as we cover in this episode, The Great Reset. Mackenzie, Walter, once again, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is going to be a very, very interesting one. So today we're going to cover this concept that's been going around quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of people on both sides of the political and social spectrum that have heard this term, the Great Reset. And we're going to dive into that a little bit today. I think we're going to try to educate people to separate fact from fiction and give a little bit of context on what we can glean from this that will help people prepare for what's coming, but also get an understanding of how these people are moving, what they believe, and why they're doing what they're doing. So as we dive into that, we're going to look at uh, what the World Economic Forum has to say about this, because this is kind of one of the organizations that is giving us an outline of what the Great Reset is. And they, they've given us a definition. I'll read it here for you. It says, the world is at a historic crossroads. As economies everywhere attempt to pull themselves out of a COVID-19-induced hiatus, the damage inflicted has been horrific in terms of lives taken and livelihoods lost. However, it presents an opportunity to rebuild in a more inclusive and responsible way. Coronavirus-related lockdowns provide a glimpse of what is possible in terms of limiting pollution and pandemic human toil illustrated what can happen when healthcare systems and social safety nets are neglected. Now it's up to leaders in the private and public sectors to seize the moment and help create a more equitable, equitable and sustainable society. There's a lot of trigger words in here, guys, that I want to draw out because we're going to see this common thread as we go through more and more and, and pick out what, what these people are trying to shape. What, what do you guys hear when you hear this description from the World Economic Forum and, and some of these trigger words such as uh, opportunity to rebuild a more inclusive society, uh, social safety nets and healthcare systems being neglected? Uh, do these things start to stand out to you as, as, as interesting given the context of what we know? Well, one thing that you find immediately is that common community which links into solidarity. Those are all the buzzwords that we hear in the world today. And uh, the divides that supposedly have divided humanity, they must disappear and we must all become part of one melting pot. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is pushing for a universal sort of inclusiveness, right? which on the surface doesn't seem to sound so bad, but I'd like to take us inside the World Economic Forum a little bit and listen to what the executive chairman, Klaus Schwab, has to say about this himself, because it'll start to give us an indication on how much of our lives will be impacted by this great reset. These are our direct quotes from Schwab himself. He says, to achieve a better outcome, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our society and economies. Now listen to what's covered in all aspects. Education to societal contracts and working conditions. Every country from the United States to China must, emphatically must participate. And every industry from oil and gas to tech, again the word must, be transformed. Now here's, here's the key. Here's how he closes this very encompassing statement out. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. It sounds like the thing that seems to be in the, in the crosshairs 
uh, for people like Klaus Schwab is capitalism being a, a central issue. Why do you think that seems to be the concept that's, that's in the crosshairs right now? Well, again, you have to look behind the scenes because who could be driving or shaping his economic plan and his economic outlook? We know what the economic outlook is that emanates from the papacy because it has been made clear in one encyclical after the other, starting with Rerum Novarum and with the, the last encyclical from Pope Francis about fraternity. And what they are driving for and moving towards is a form of socialism which has uh, similarities with fascism where the state and the industry are in partnership for the sake of the community. And this model is obviously the papal model. Now you have to ask yourself, this Klaus Schwab, where does he come from? And why is he such an important voice in the world that we are living in? And you can ask yourself, where was he educated? He was educated at the University of Freiburg, which is a Jesuit-run university. So again, we have that connection that links them all together. And the agenda is exactly the same as that which is proposed by these powers. Okay, so we have another connection here again to the Jesuits. Now we're going to connect this a little bit deeper further in the episode we have some very interesting references and quotes um so what then why would this group of people these people be targeting specifically capitalism what's the issue with capitalism why is that why is that a problem for this this world order that they're trying to to bring forth if you go back into history you will see that they have initiated two streams. The one is capitalism, where private enterprise runs the system, and the papacy has consistently complained about it as too individualistic and self-centered and not geared towards what they so often refer to as the poor. And uh, <laughs> it's quite ironic that they do much for the poor, but never with their own funds, only with public funds. And then the other system that they set up and that they practiced in their reductions in South America was communism, which is the individual has no participation other than obedience and the state runs everything. So that sets up the Hegelian dialectic of thesis and antithesis. And this kind of socialism, which is a form of fascism, which they are propagating, is nicely in the middle and is what we call the synthesis. So you set up two systems which create uh, the paradigm for the move to the Great Reset which eventually becomes the economic plan of the Roman Catholic system. And that is where they're heading, and they're doing it quite brilliantly and without people apparently noticing. But if you have your ears to the ground, you should be able to see it. Yeah, and to that end, you'll see that uh, Schwab himself has additional uh, very vocal opinions and views on what this should look like and, and what it would look like for the world. So I'd like to continue looking at some of his statements here where he says, we must build an entirely new foundation for our economic and social systems. The level of cooperation and ambition this implies is unprecedented. So he's, he's calling for a totally new foundational structure of every part of our economic and social fabric of our society. And he acknowledges that this will be an unprecedented uh, move towards um, uh, this new system. He continues, he said, but it's not some sort of impossible dream. In fact, one silver lining of the pandemic, and we'll see as we, as we look at more of these quotes, you, you hear very opportunistic language 
coming out of this pandemic. There are certain groups of people in the world that have found this to be a uh, if you, when you read their own quotes, a fantastic opportunity for something. And as we look more and more, we'll kind of see what they, what they see this, this valued opportunity as. He says, it's a silver lining of the pandemic has shown that we can quickly make radical changes to our lifestyle. Almost instantly, the crisis forced businesses and individuals to abandon practices long claimed to be essential from frequent air travel to working in an office. So he's taking very normal parts of everyday livelihoods for people and showing how quickly these things can change. Uh, He even continues saying that the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future. Uh, boy, he really seems like he's got our best interests at heart. They're, they're looking to make our future healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous. But what about those people who are already experiencing that kind of, of life and contributing to others' lives in such a way? How will their lives be transformed uh, in this shift towards new foundations of economic and social systems? Well, one thing the Economic Forum has already made quite clear is that part of the package is that private ownership will disappear. And basically, it is a shift back to the system of the Middle Ages where you had the feudal system with the, the lords and the, the elites in harmony and in partnership with Rome, the one acting as the temporal head, the other one as the spiritual head over all, and ownership residing entirely with the spiritual head, who then disseminates it according to his will. That is what you had in the Middle Ages. That is when a pope had the power to divide a continent and say this belongs to so-and-so, and and this belongs to so-and-so to govern. And if you do not govern according to my will, then you will be removed and replaced by someone else. So that same system seems to be on the cards. And uh, what did it do to, to your private initiative? You can just look at that era and you will understand why history labeled it the Dark Ages. So this is not light. This is darkness. Now that's an interesting concept because now why, I want to just ask the question, why are we all bringing this up right now? Now, why are we saying that we're going back to this system? Well, we'll see pretty quickly that this is this is really the plan. This is what they're even saying. This isn't just conjecture. We're not just saying stuff here. This is actually what they're saying. And we're gonna show a couple more quotes here. Um, and and you can already see there's an undertone to how these people are writing. You also have to ask yourself the question. Is there a spiritual agenda behind all of this? Well, obviously, there was a spiritual agenda in the Middle Ages. And when people said, no, you have to make up your own mind based on the knowledge at hand. And Martin Luther and the Reformers said, no, we do not run according to the system and according to your culture that you've set up and your traditions, we run according to another standard, which happens to be the Word of God. And then each individual gets to decide what their truth in their life is going to be. And that doesn't suit this power at all, because absolute control requires absolute power. And that is where they are heading. To have absolute power, you first have to disempower those who currently have the power. So the middle class will have to go because that is where a large proportion of the power resides. Small industry will have to go and they're doing a great job by disassembling it. And as you said, a stay and work from home culture under the guise of 
in protecting the environment, getting rid of the rush, all these positive buzzwords, but you have no control over your life. You're basically back to being a bird in a cage. And I want to draw people's attention to what this might look like practically. You know, there's been some articles written that saying, oh, there's all these alarmists uh, saying this great reset is this global power shift. And that's not the case. It's more of an ideological, almost an academic view of how we can move and change in our future. But there's actually been a uh, what may be a whistleblower leaked email that's been going around. There will be people who contend this is not the case. And I just want to give our viewers and our listeners, we're more bringing this out as an awareness to you so you can be aware of the information out there. And we're going to try to provide some context for this information and the timelines associated. We're not endorsing it. We're not saying this is going to happen exactly as the email says. But we'd be remiss if things did happen the way that this email uh, portrays and we didn't warn you about it and give you some indication along with some sourced information that suggests that many of the things in here seem to be on the right track. So just to provide a little context, this was going around from inside the um, Liberal Party of Canada, and it was said to have originated from the Strategic Planning Committee, which actually sits inside the Prime Minister's office. And we got this back in, I want to say October, and we kind of waited on it because there were some dates that were coming up here in November that we wanted to just see how things were going and, and make sure that this this wasn't out of left field. And we saw that what the document said would happen in November actually started to happen exactly as the document said. And we actually gathered some information in the process that supported some of the additional claims that were found in the email. Now, I'm not going to review the whole thing. We'll try to link it for people so they can see it for themselves. But I'm going to go over a couple of highlights and things that re relate to what we're going to discover more about the Great Reset as it relates to some of the organizations that we're going to take a, a closer look at. It said that in November in the country of Canada that there was going to be additional lockdown measures that started out in our major metropolitan areas first and then kind of expanded to your more rural areas. And what we saw was that's exactly what happened. We saw restrictions open up in Toronto and Vancouver and some of the other major cities in Canada. And as we got further into the month, those continued to expand out where recommendation for travel within a province and inter-province was strongly uh, recommended against. Uh, restrictions of who you could have in your home uh, have come out and are now implemented. And we see that there's some additional things seem to be on the docket for uh, December quarter one of 2021, quarter two and quarter three of 2021 that include everything from stricter lockdowns to uh, possible mutations of a more aggressive strain of um, the, the current public health crisis that's, that's spurring the public health crisis, as well as uh, the additional concept of universal basic income and something that involves the International Monetary Fund uh, called a global debt reset program. Now, there's going to be a lot of speculation. People think we may be um, going into territories that are unverified. But what we actually see is uh, Prime Minister Trudeau talking about a lot of these similar elements. In addition to the, the measures that go along with the public health crisis, let's take a listen to what Trudeau has to say about Canada's involvement within the United Nations goals, as well as some of the IMF goals as it relates to uh, debt relief. Let's take a listen. The last six months have laid bare fundamental gaps and inequities within our societies and between them. As with climate change, those who have the least are impacted the most. That's why last spring, Canada worked with Prime Minister Andrew Holness and Secretary General Antonio Guterres to convene a high-level meeting to discuss how leaders around the world could work together to close these gaps and build a better, more equitable system that works for everyone. I'd like to pause this here. We're going to listen to more from Trudeau here. 
but we're already seeing some trigger language that we saw from Schwab, the uh, executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And what we're hearing is the very same narrative of the world's not fair. The crisis that are coming from multiple different levels are affecting one group of people more than they are another group of people. And the system seems to be broken and we need to do something about it. And you hear that he's actually brought up Antonio Gutierrez, who we'll look at more closely at the UN. But as you start to hear more of these world leaders discuss this Great Reset issue, why do we keep hearing almost the exact same language used by all the different leaders. May I just comment that the leaders that are the most vocal in the world at the moment all come from first world countries. And they are talking about a great reset and about the, the great disparity between the rich and the poor. Now, if you break that down, that would obviously mean, if they're going to reset that system, is that the first world countries will have to give up something so that the others could gain something. And that is breaking down the system that has been set up throughout the world over the last hundreds of years. And uh, the most prosperous nations are those that were derived from the Protestant system. And they have to be dismantled because if you have that much power and that much ownership, then you are not readily subject to another power. So you have to dismantle it in order to bring about a system of equity where everybody is subject to a central power. So if I may ask another question, who stands to lose? Uh, you're, you're Canadians. Does the, does the future prospect for your prosperity uh, look absolutely rosy or are you going to, according to this speech, expect a downgrade? It definitely seems like there's a tendency toward a downgrade. At least for those that are in uh, a comfortable position. Yes. And how do you achieve that? How do you achieve that? You destroy that which you rely upon, which is your industry, your private-owned industry. That has to go. And then you become a slave to the system because in order to survive, You have to rely on what they are now actually implementing, which is a government handout to sustain you. And once you are totally dependent upon that, then the government has total control over you. I'm always surprised in the third world countries, why is there no effort to improve the economies? Why are they happy to see them coast along and even live in a downward spiral until everything is basically destroyed. If you look at Africa, one economy after the other is in a spiral, and they're talking a lot, but they're talking about a great reset, they're talking about a new future, they're talking about bailouts, they're talking about debt relief, and uh, all of these issues. But all of them come with a price tag if the World Economic Forum is attached to this, and that price tag means that you are subject to the control and whim of another power. He who pays the piper calls the tune. What's interesting is instead of trying to build the economies of the other countries, they just want to remove the top end off all of them. It's like, for some reason, people who are well off are the problem and not trying to help the people who are lower, but just trying to get rid of the people off the top. Exactly. And for our listeners or our viewers who are not familiar with this concept, this is actually a textbook strategy called liberation theology, 
But the concept is that it's capitalism that has oppressed the poor. It is actually the enemy of the uplifting of the poor. So as we listen to people like Schwab and others uh, at the UN and the International Monetary Fund and around the world, we get a growing sense that the enemy of this group that has a goal for a great reset is very much to get rid of capitalism as it's seen as the enemy and the the uh, the entity that is holding down and oppressing those who have not. And you'll see this theology down in South America, which is interesting because we see that Pope Francis, as well as the head of, of the Jesuit order, Arturo Sosa, are both Latin Americans who very much support this concept of liberation theology. So I, I want people to understand as we go further, that the, these are not necessarily natural progressions of, of human society. These are not natural evolutions of human behavior that were actually being manipulated to feel guilty for uh, those things that, that um, rich nations or Protestant, primarily Protestant nations, have set up, which when you look at are based on individual rights, individual liberties, where this system that they'd like to replace it with is very much a standard of community, common good, uh, greater good, all at the expense of individual civil liberties and rights and privacies and ownerships. And so you'll you'll actually find that as we go deeper and deeper, we're, we're being taken down a, a line of thinking that has been around for quite some time and is thoroughly supported by those who support uh, a Jesuit line of thinking, which could also in some senses be along the lines of a socialist or even on the more extreme ends of a, a communistic line of thinking. But let's go back to Trudeau here as he's going to deliver more trigger words and more key concepts that will give us some more insights into what the Great Reset looks like for first world nations. Over the course of the summer, our six working groups produced over 250 policy options. On September 8th, finance ministers gathered to discuss these options and their recommendations for the short, medium, and long term. The most promising ideas will be taken up within existing IMF and World Bank processes, as well as at the G7 and G20 leaders' summits later in the fall. Then, in December, we're going to have the opportunity to meet again to discuss the progress we've made. Because we understand that right now we have to fix urgent problems, but in the long run, we also have to fix the system so that it works for everyone. I want to stop again there. Uh, we hear some trigger words. International Monetary Fund is involved here. World Bank is involved here. And he cites a very broken system that needs to be replaced long term. So we're going to keep going, but I just wanted to point out that these are the powers that we want to look at a little bit more in this episode so people are kind of aware of which direction we're going. To eliminate this virus anywhere, we need to eliminate it everywhere. While scientists work around the clock to develop a vaccine as governments, we have the responsibility to ensure it'll be distributed quickly and fairly around the world. On Friday, I announced that Canada will provide $440 million to the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility, including $220 million to the Advanced Market Commitment to help low- and middle-income countries access vaccines. This is an important initiative, and I encourage other governments to join in as well. We need to work together, and not just on vaccines. Canada believes that a strong, coordinated response across the world and across sectors is essential. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems that actually address global challenges like extreme poverty, inequality, and climate change. Is it, did I just hear Klaus Schwab speaking, or was this the Prime Minister of Canada? Because the 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 narrative is so similar that I'm having trouble distinguishing where did this agenda stem from? Was it Did it start with the World Economic Forum? Did it start at the governmental level? What do you guys hear with, with uh, Trudeau using some of this language involving, we know Gutierrez at the UN, now we have the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, what do you guys hear when you hear this kind of language being used in the midst of the crisis that we're currently in? Well, you definitely hear that there's a similarity to what all these guys are saying. And you hear 
the trigger words, and a lot. This is a packed uh, little piece here from Trudeau. And he says that we need a great reset. And he said it was a pre-pandemic plan. So this isn't a response to a pandemic, like most people were saying, oh, this is, uh, it's, it's not something that was planned before. This is just something that's, you know, because everything had to be shut down and now people are needing help. No, this is something that was before. So it, it's not something new. It's, it's pre-pandemic plan, this great reset. And uh, the other issue is that they are riding a specific horse, and that is called COVID-19. Now, the statistics that are coming out in the world and that are being um, very publicly mentioned in many, many forums, including the European parliaments, is that the statistics really show that the COVID-19 is, if anything, less Uh, virulent than the SARS virus was. And they are rushing towards a universal inoculation of all of humanity for one specific viral strain when they are acknowledging that it will mutate into other strains probably in the near future. Well, then they'll have to start rushing into new vaccines for those And then whatever subsequent dilemma they face, they will have to rush into those again. So it's not about vaccines. It's not about the the level of disease which is produced by the particular virus because we've had worse strains in the past. So what is it really about? It's about the Great Reset. That's what they want. And they're just riding this horse, which is either a pandemic or a pandemic, whichever way you want to look at it. And this is not actually new. This whole concept of a reset, this whole concept of the resetting of the world systems, the social systems, we actually have seen a, a trail that most people have missed because they're busy with their everyday lives. And as we talked about last time, there's not really a, a time to set aside to study and research history and the players and the people and what, what groups they're a part of. But we actually have seen in our fairly recent American history, uh, another U.S. president referring to what is a very United Nations agenda. Uh, we, we see that Trudeau and we'll see that a lot of these other world leaders and global organizations are tying this in with climate change, which are very much related to the sustainable development goals, what's also known as the 2030 agenda by the United Nations. And we can actually see, if we go back a little bit, George Bush Sr. talking about this issue Mackenzie, tell us a little bit about what you found when you uh, looked into uh, this this uh, commentary by the former U.S. president. So a couple interesting things. Um, with that interview of Trudeau, he actually continues. We don't have time to play all of it, but it's extremely interesting. And uh, later on in the interview, he actually says that he's wanting to work the 2030 agenda of the U.N., He says that right in this interview. So that's very interesting because you can see where his mindset is coming from. It's very UN orientated. Now, I have a couple clips here that are extremely interesting because we think that each country is very nationalist, but we'll find out that they're not as nationalist as you may think. So I have... Three clips here that are extremely interesting. We've signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets. We're included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Uh, Let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, The United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. So what are some of the interesting things that you guys seen in this first clip while I grab the other one? Yes, there is something interesting in that. Uh, He quite categorically said that the United States 
has to be the leader when it comes to the environmental issues. Now, it seems as though the opposite happened under the Trump administration because they withdrew from the Paris Accord. But Donald Trump had a very interesting statement where he said that in spite of their withdrawal, the United States is actually ahead of all the countries in terms of implementing the agreement that was reached in Paris. So they are streets ahead of any other nation when it comes to uh, compliance, even though they've withdrawn. And now the president has said that he will take the, the United States back into that forum, and it would actually enter into that forum as the leader because, according to Donald Trump, they are ahead of the other nations. So still, every, still, still everything went according to plan, even though it seemed not to go according to plan. Okay. So we see that they're very much uh, on the same trajectory, uh, even if they almost seem that they're not, as the United Nations goals here. So now here's a couple uh, interesting clips where uh, Bush Sr. is saying that we need to fulfill the dreams of the founders of the United Nations. This is an historic moment. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and Cold War. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. So he was very clear in that he wanted this new world order that the UN desires and dreams to institute. We'll play one more clip here. Until now, the world we've known has been a world divided, a world of barbed wire and concrete block, conflict, cold war. Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order, in the words of Winston Churchill, a world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. A world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders. Okay, so some very interesting points there. Uh, he said that where it protects the weak against the strong. Sounds very similar to some of the things that these guys have been saying with the Great Reset, where we need to get rid of the rich because they're, they're the bad guys. He uses the word we on a very regular basis. And we have to ask ourselves who the we is. Does it refer to the United States? Obviously not, because... He's talking about relinquishing that power to the United Nations. So the we must be a power behind the scenes. Again, linking back to our previous conversation, what society was he a member of? He was a member of Skull and Bones. Chapter 322, and that was, if we trace it back, a chapter from the German society of the Illuminati as founded by Adolf Weishaupt and then we're back to the Jesuit order and we're back to the Roman Catholic system and the aim of the Jesuits is very well known. It is to restore the papal supremacy that was lost after the Reformation and the mortal wound. And that is exactly the agenda that they're talking about. He is, in fact, talking about fraternity 
which is the latest encyclical of the Pope. He also spoke about concrete blocks and walls. And we know that Donald Trump was uh, <laughs> very instrumental in erecting concrete blocks and walls, and that under great opposition from Rome. And the new man on the block is talking about dismantling that kind of process. In other words, opening the floodgates and opening the borders so that those differences between the ultra-poor and the ultra-rich will be swamped and disappear in this new mix that they're waiting for, which they call the Great Reset. It seems that that is like the main goal for this new world order, something that maybe people have heard about for a long time, but what really does new world order mean? Uh, it's, it's a great reset of what? Capitalism, a new world economic order. This is all to, to change the whole system and way society operates. So I think we're going to see a little bit that the amount of freedom you have today is going to be shifted a little bit slightly as we continue. We must not forget that coupled to that economic order, there is also a new spiritual order. Because there are all these efforts to unite religions in terms of a common good goal for humanity. And that the differences in terms of doctrine should be downplayed for the sake of the common good. So these two run parallel. You cannot divorce the spiritual from the temporal and economic. Which is a very interesting concept for most people because they think that those two things are extremely separate. And for some, maybe it is very separate. But for these people, these high up people who want to implement this new world order, it's one and the same. It, they have to run together parallel in order for the system to fully work. That's why the United Nations has organizations within it that have extreme spiritual goals, the Temple of Understanding and all of these, and the United Nations trapezoid prayer room and all of the issues that go along with that. This is an illumination but it is actually luciferian at its base yeah and i think we can actually take our audience through finding out how they can arrive at these conclusions themselves so we've looked a little bit about what the great reset is and now we've kind of put in our our crosshairs here what organization we really want to look at as we to kind of pull apart the pieces for this episode is we're going to look at the United Nations. I think it's an organization that generally people around the world see as a uh, harmless kind of global governing guidance, general good uh, for people. And, but what we see is there's actually a lot of history to this organization. There's actually a lot of interesting architecture in the UN facilities and so we're going to look a little bit deeper inside of the UN and start to help you, the viewer, the listener, understand how we can confidently say there is a very spiritual component to the UN. And we're going to look a little bit deeper at what that is by first starting with the head of the UN, current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. And we find that Guterres is actually a Roman Catholic, number one, a devout Roman Catholic who has a very special relationship with Pope Francis, but he's also used to be the head and president of an organization called Socialist International. And when we read more and more of this language about the Great Reset, you get very, very socialist overtones, and there's going to be people on some sides of the political spectrum that are going to roll their eyes at this, but let's just use the, their own language to determine where they sit and let's look at their prior credentials, for instance, in Gutierrez's case, uh, that when you're the president of a society called Socialist International, 
there isn't much speculation or conjecture needed to say that the preferred form of governance for this individual head of the UN currently is absolutely socialism. And he actually gives us a quote about his views on the Great Reset, where he said, the Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. We must build more equal, inclusive, and sustainable economies and societies that are more resilient in the face of pandemics, climate change, and the many other global changes we face. So we hear, you know, now through Trudeau, through Bush, through Schwab, we see this world is uh, inequitable. We need to be more inclusive. We see the climate change narrative. But he's got a friend in this whole thing. He's got a friend, Al Gore, who has aligned with the UN on many of these things, who spoke about the Great Reset as well, where he said, I think this is a time for a Great Reset. We've got to fix a lot of these problems, capitalism, that have been allowed to fester for way too long. So we're, we're seeing the world leaders uh, are very uniformly in agreement with what the problem is, and we see that it's capitalism, and what capitalism has led to, which is inequality, injustice, unbalanced uh, economic and social um, characteristics for different groups of people, marginalized groups of people. But I'd like to actually go deeper into the United Nations and really start to understand what this organization is, where it came from, and look at the founders of this particular group that has now and is quickly becoming a global governing body. Uh, Mackenzie, why don't you walk us through some of what we know about the founding members of the United Nations, which used to be, of course, the League of Nations. So there's a couple interesting things going on there with the United Nations. Um, they're founded in 1919. Uh, the forerunner was, as you said, the League of Nations, which that's an important point because you'll see who, in order to find the founders of the United Nations, you need to understand the founders of the League of Nations. Uh, this is from the UN's website. So I'm quoting the United Nations website. The forerunner of the United Nations was the League of Nations, an organization conceived in similar circumstances during the First World War and established in 1919 under the Treaty of Versailles to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. So what we get from here is that the League of Nations was the, the precursor to the United Nations. So who was uh, involved in forming the League of Nations? One of the founders of the League of Nations, uh, his name was Arthur Belfour. Uh, he was also a member of Hort's Apostles. Now, who is Hort? And Walter, could you give us a little more background on Arthur Belfour and who this Hort is and uh, how they're connected into the, the League of Nations and now what we see as the United Nations? Well, Westcott and Hort were the two that created the new Greek document on which the modern translations of the Bible are based. And uh, there is a lot of speculation that these people weren't really Protestant at all. After all, Hort was a self-proclaimed Mariologist, which doesn't very well fit into uh, the Protestant thinking. He was also in line with uh, Roman Catholicism in terms of the Eucharist. And both Westcott and Hort were deeply involved in spiritualism. They were evolutionists. So the evidence seems to point to the fact that these individuals were clandestine Jesuits posing as Protestants to bring about an agenda where the Bible can be used, in, well, especially in terms of the new translations based on uh, their rendition of the Greek text, that it could be used to favor Roman Catholic doctrine 
over Protestant doctrine. Okay, and and one other point. Uh, it's very interesting that they were very spiritualist. Um, they were heading the Society of Psychic Research. Um, plus, he initiated a society called the Synthetic Society, which one of their main goals was to create a one-world religion. So now we see a connection here more spiritually. So there's a one-world order, but there has to also go parallel with that a one-world religion. So we see this, this coming into play a little bit more all the way back to the founders of the United Nations. So let's let's take our, our listeners and viewers back a little bit and rehash what we said because we've had a lot of information that's probably coming at them and they're saying, whoa, what's happening here? So what we've done is we're saying right now in today, our, our current timeline, the UN is at the very center of what is happening across the world in terms of the Great Reset. What we did is look back and in 1919 saw that these this group of men created this League of Nations. And inside that League of Nations, you have a very spiritual component among these original founders who were not only spiritualists, but held seances and were part of, of a line of thinking that is very much a, in, in spiritual in nature with the goal of bringing about a one world system of governance. And as Mackenzie mentioned, a one world religion. So we're seeing this timeline that can't be ignored because if if we look at an organization today, we have to look at it when it was founded to get the context and the narrative and, and the, the, uh, the, the kind of sense around that organization when it was created at its inception. Because what we're going to do now is ask you, the viewer, the listener, to do something that helps you find out this information for yourself. I want each of you who has the ability on your phone, your tablet, your computer, whatever you have access to that's connected to the internet, to go to Google and type in the words world goodwill. Two words, world goodwill. This is going to bring up the very first search term that you will see is from an organization called Lucius Trust. I'd like you to click on that link World Goodwill, Lucius Trust, and scroll all the way down to the bottom footer where you'll see a number of links and one in particular that says service and the divine plan. Now, to give you a little context, the reason we're doing this is because Walter earlier mentioned there are a number of very spiritual organizations inside of the UN with World Goodwill being one of those what's called an NGO. This is a non-governmental organization fully sanctioned by the United Nations. And in fact, when you look at where their offices are, they're on United Nations Boulevard in the same building as the United Nations in New York. Now, this organization, World Goodwill, is a subsidiary of Lucius Trust. Now, as you guys get to that link, I hope some of you are able to do this in real time, going to the website and clicking on that bottom link, that says service and the divine plan. Walter, before I, we get into what's on this page, can you tell us a little bit about who Lucius Trust is, what it is, and where it kind of came from, and why it might sit inside of the UN today? Well, let's first uh, go from the present a little bit back. This organization bases itself on the writings of Alice A. Bailey. Now, Alice A. Bailey was the successor of Blavatsky. And they started an organization which had a publication which was called Lucifer Publishing. So the name, of course, was very contentious because they made no bones about where their allegiance lay. It did not lie with the God of the Bible, but with the great rebel, Lucifer. And so, because the name created so much turmoil, they changed the name to Lucis Trust, which is exactly the same thing. Now, if you read the writings of Blavatsky, which is basically the prophet of, or the prophetess of the New Age, 
which they sort of bypass by using the name of the successor, which is Alice A. Bailey. And she talks about the hierarchy, and we saw that word flashed there on the screen a moment ago. If you look into that hierarchy, that hierarchy refers not to a human hierarchy, but to a spiritual hierarchy of ascended so-called masters who actually pull the strings. So this is spiritism at its highest level. And the leader of this hierarchy is none other than Lucifer, who they claim will manifest first through certain luminaries and then personally. So this is really the antithesis of what the Bible is all about. This is the worship of Lucifer and not even in a disguised form. Now I want to keep people right there because that's all the time we have for this episode. But if you think you got some interesting information now, just wait till we continue this conversation next episode where we'll dive into what the real plan is of the United Nations and the surrounding organizations. We're going to introduce you to a new organization that many of you probably have never heard before and continue to peel back the layers because, my friends, this is coming right to our front door. And we want to give you this information so you have the tools to prepare, that you have the ability to help others in the meantime, and that you will be able to confidently move without fear through what is coming next. So Mackenzie, Walter, thank you so much for joining us. An amazing episode. We'll hope to see you guys again soon. Take care. Hi, YouTube. I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.